Um, so I am, for those of you who don't, who don't know, I'm Lisa Mangum. I'm managing editor of Shadow Mountain, which is the national market imprint of Deseret Book. I've been in publishing almost 20, it'll be 20 years this June. And so I've edited a lot of books. Um, I have read a lot of books. I have written a lot of books. Um, so by day I'm managing editor. By night I write young adult love stories. Uh, weekends I am obsessed with Supernatural. <laughs> Super awesome. <laughs> Uh, so we're, I just have a couple quick slides I want to go through. Um, the, the purpose of this class and this demonstration is to um, help you see how an editor approaches the kinds of things that I look for, the kinds of things I change, the kinds of things I don't change. Now every editor is going to be a little different. Um, that's part of the relationship between the author and editor, but hopefully you'll get some tips on how to look at your own work to, for self-editing or um, get inside what things are important to an editor. So the very first thing I want to mention is when, when it comes to editing, it's a top-down process. So you have to look at, we always look at the big picture stuff first before we drill down to the little stuff. So we do content editing first before we do copy edit. And one of the first things I look at when I'm looking at new manuscripts or a new project is I, I it's very basic. I check to make sure I have everything I'm going to need. Did the author remember to include acknowledgments? Do I have all of the footnotes? Do I have all of the citations? Do I actually have the end of the book? Um, because many things that I do for cleanup, I have macros, I only want to run them once, I'm, and it's easier to batch process if I have all everything together in the book. Um, I'll apply styles. I work in Microsoft Word, and so I just use their pre-loaded styles for heading one, heading two, heading three, um, quotes, things like that to help d differentiate the text so that down the road when it goes into typesetting and design, they'll know to, that chapter number should look like this, chapter title should look like this, this particular book has <coughs> letters, correspondence between characters, so I'm gonna want a handwrit handwritten font, those kinds of things. Uh, there's a great program called File Cleaner, it's at editorium.com, my friend Jack built that. Um, check it out, get it if you like it, thank me later, it's a, it's a package of macros that you can run at a click of a button that clean up a gazillion things like extraneous tabs and double spaces after periods and making sure your quotation marks are curly instead of straight and it will do your footnotes for you and it will do a gazillion things and I use it all the time to just clean up the kind of stuff that looks invisible on the screen. I always turn on revision tracking in Word because the, edit, the author is going to review my edit. And so I need to show my work. I have to show everything I changed so that we can have a conversation about what they agree with and what they don't agree with. And, we, and I can keep track of where if problems show up. And I always use a dictionary. I am obsessive about looking stuff up because I am not a great speller, but I am a great dictionary user. And I'm always surprised at the words that are hyphenated or compound or misspelled. <laughs> Um, so, content editing is, like I said, it's a top-down. I'm going through this kind of fast, but I'll post this on the Facebook page so you can look at these slides a little bit later. These are some of the things that I look for that I want to make sure are present or that I'm going to fix or that I need to strengthen. This mostly is for fiction, but it also applies a lot to nonfiction. So I'm going to look for consistency issues. I'm going to look for plot holes, obviously. I'm going to look for errors in logic, repetition of ideas or of language or of words. If your POV starts to shift, I will call you on it. Um, if your tense shifts, I will call you on it. I want to make sure your voice is consistent. That's editing for voice is one of the hardest things to do. I want to make sure, especially for fiction, that your dialogue and your plot and your characters are authentic and compelling. So then we drop down. That's usually the first pass. So I'll go through a manuscript once. I'll read it all the way through with my pen in hand or at the computer, jotting those kinds of reactions down. I don't understand this. Chapter four seems to be really slow. What's the point of having this character in your book? This is a really great part. You should keep it and expand on it. Um, then it goes back to the author for revisions. And then it comes back. Um, I read it again. Everything looks pretty solid. Then I'll dive into copy editing, which is grammar, spelling, and punctuation. These are your parts of speech. You don't have to write them all down, but you should know what they do. <laughs> These are the tools for the words that you're using. Um, spelling is always a big I issue. Um, and for me personally, it's always hyphenation, always trips me up. So which of the following words on that list is misspelled? Lightheaded, rearview mirror, heartbroken, brokenhearted, hardheaded, seatbelt, water wheel, hard line. Which one is misspelled? Hard line? 
broken hearted? Seatbelt. Seatbelt? All of mine. Nope. Light headed is hyphenated. Which is weird because hard headed isn't. <laughs> English is stupid that way. So that's why if I even suspect there's a chance that it could be a compound word or two words or hyphenated, I always, always, always look it up. And I use Miriam Webster's 11th Collegiate Edition Dictionary, religiously. And whatever dictionary you choose to use, use it consistently. Um, then I, the other thing I look for also is punctuation, commas. Who, who is afraid of the comma? It's okay. They are crazy. And it's the most common error I find are um, commas in the wrong place or not present where they should be. So these are just some of the places where you use commas. There are actually a few more, but these are the ones that are most uh, common. The serial comma, uh, you, it's also known as the Oxford comma. Use it religiously or I will come get you. Uh, you, you use a comma when independent clauses are joined by and, but, or, so, or yet. You don't use it with compound predicates. You also use it when a noun is preceded by coordinating adjectives, and you can use it after an introductory word or phrase. That one's a little tricky because introductory words or phrases can sometimes be really long, they can sometimes be really short, and some of that depends on your, the house style that the editor is using to say an introductory phrase has to be more than three words in order for it to qualify for a comma. That's not a hard and fast rule, that's a house style rule that might, be, that might change from place to place. Semicolons, you're going to use between two independent clauses not joined by a conjunction in order to signal a close connection. You're not being elitist if you use a semicolon. <laughs> you're just using it properly. Um, it is a perfectly valid punctuation mark. Don't overuse it. If a period will do, use that. Periods can be invisible. But sometimes a semicolon is, in fact, the correct punctuation. So be brave and use it. Um, dashes, there are usually three kinds of dashes. Hyphen, this is sort of an easy way to remember where and when to use them. A hyphen is the dash between words. An N dash, which is slightly longer, is used between numbers. Usually that's to, for dates, um, years, or in an index. You'll see it a lot in indexes. And then an M dash, which is the longest, is you use it between thoughts. And often M dashes are used in pairs. Not always, but often you're offsetting something in the middle of a sentence with M dashes on either side. Ellipses, I don't know why we always have a big conversation about ellipses. Here's the truth, they are always three dots. <laughs> if you see something that has four dots, one of those dots is a period, followed by ellipses, which are three dots with spaces between them. <laughs> is that your question? No, I was going to ask, how do you continue after? Do you not capitalize or do you capitalize after an ellipse? Her question is, do you capitalize or not after an ellipse? It depends on the sentence. Okay. So often ellipses are to indicate trailing thought or an interrupted sort of like, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, but now I'm going to start over, in which case I'm, I would probably cap it. Okay. Or your trailing off, but then you pick back up and it's the exact same thought, in which case you wouldn't capitalize it. So it's, it totally depends, depends okay. on the context. Um, and I, will, I hope in the story we'll have ellipses to show you how that works. Um, remember your pairs, parentheses, brackets, and quotation marks should always be in pairs. Um, it's the buddy system, don't use one without the other. And um, an e a question that comes up a lot is, um, when do I italicize things and when do I put things in quotes? So here's a mnemonic device that I came up with that has helped me and maybe it will help you. Things that are long and heavy, like books and movies and albums and magazines and TV shows, they're heavy. They have to go on a shelf, right? So you underline them, which in typography terms means to italicize. The proofreading mark of underlining is to italicize. So that's how you can remember. If things are short, if it's a poem, if it's a short story, if it's an article in a magazine, if it's the name of an episode in a TV show, those are little, you can hang them on hooks. See? I know, we're all gonna get it right. Um, and that, that should probably take care of like 80 to 90% of your questions. Um, so Chicago's Manual of Style, 
The 16th edition is the current edition that's out. That, that goes into great detail if you have other kinds of questions for paintings and sculptures and ship names, which are actually all italicized and, you know, capitalization and um, formats of titles and things like that. So I know I went through that super fast, but we're going to get to the good stuff and actually do the editing live. So let's get going, right? Like I said, I'll put these slides just on the um, LTUE Facebook page as, one, as, a, as a document if you want to see them again. Any questions really fast before we get started? Because you asked a really good question and you're right here. Pick a number between 1 and 65. Oh, this is a good one. Okay, so a couple years ago, I did an anthology for Wordfire Press um, called Dragon Riders. And I got like 80-something submissions and I narrowed it down. These are the ones that did not get picked, but that's okay. Because it means they, they have not been edited. Can you guys see that okay? Oh, oh. Do, do you want me to do yours? Okay. Tell me again what it was called. I think it was Dragons of Kali. That's right. Thank you for your permission. I, I always worry about that. Obviously not enough to like, <laughs> <laughs> but this is better. <laughs> Allie's story is in here. And so this is what we're gonna do. Okay, so the requirements for the anthology were is it had to have a dragon in it and it had to have some sort of theme of creativity or invention that was pretty open. So the first thing that I do is um, I'm gonna turn my tracking on. Normally, I would put no markup because I don't want to see all the things that I change. But I'm going to leave it on so that you can see all of the stuff that we change. So I'm going to do all markup and I'm going to do just heading one and heading two because those are going to be the different levels that eventually start to show up. Um, now, you'll notice that she this showed up in Times New Roman 12 point type with spaces between paragraphs but not indents. I don't, I don't like any of that. So uh, I always edit with um, in Verdana 12 point because it's easy on the eyes. It's a sans serif font and it was designed to be read on a screen. So I've done it long enough, something triggers in my brain like, oh, now I'm editing. I think about it differently. Um, I'm also going to make sure everything gets indented and I'm going to do a quick search and replace on find replace double paragraph returns and I'm going to just change it to one uh, replace all oh mm -hmm. that's all too. Sometimes Word is trying to be super helpful and it isn't always super helpful. I don't know why it didn't do what I wanted it to do. We'll just pretend that it did. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta roll with the punches. Okay, and truthfully, it won't, it won't make a difference for this presentation, it's just my head. I'm like, I normally, at the end of the day, these, these paragraphs, the double paragraphs, should only be used if it's a scene break in which case actually you should have some sort of element in there, um, a hashtag mark or asterisks or a little note in brackets that says scene break. Um, so that as it travels down into typesetting and design, we know to leave a space there. Um, I worked on a book one time where the authors had laboriously put in all the scene breaks with double paragraphs and I didn't notice. And I ran the macro that said, oh, just clean them all up. And they were gone. And I'm like, Dear author, can you please put all of those back in where you need them to be because I didn't pay close enough attention. It was very sad. Okay, so, um, Ali, you'll have to forgive me. I, haven't pro I probably haven't read this since I read it before. So, here we go. Uh, so, I have, normally I would have read the whole story and I suspect this one will come back to me as we do. So I'm going to read the first couple pages because you, you need to have context before you actually start editing. So, here we go. Everybody still hear me all right? Armander rocks in the rusty desk chair, meditating to the squeak with each small movement. Fingering the torn patch by his leg, he eyes the scorch marks along rooftops beyond the stone-framed window. 
Drawing on his hookah, he manages a small grin as another splash of color hits the wall. Purple, his favorite. Today, the Holly Festival is in full swing and the Dragon Wars are in a lull. Armander recalls the previous night as the dragons of the keep lit the bonfire to start the festival. I release my fear of the monsters. I forgive my foes as is tradition. I forgive you for leaving me. Is it Sita? Sita. It's nice having the author for pronunciation. <laughs> Genevieve rushes through the doorway, sending the curtains billowing. Her fiery curls bounce about, creating that halo of wildness and goddess. I have the plans, she grins. The freckles on her round face fold into the lines. Armander enjoys the charm of her enchanting ivory skin. His own dark brown skin was loathed in his home. He finds the deep tea taint of his cross-hatched skin to be admirably unique in spite of the old racist ideas of his Indian brothers. Tossing her rolled parchments along the dining table that doubles as desk in this dim war room, she bubbles on. I remembered in the dreams last night, blessed, blessed ye Bridget, the paintings I made as a child. Now my mother would yell at me to quit my messing about with my hands waving the air and all, and my da ne'er would have believed that I was really painting with. Have you seen Aziz? Armander interrupts. Her smile transforms into a scowl. Now, why don't you ever listen to me, you big lout? I come in here with, focus, Genevieve. Aziz, have you seen him? Armander admires the way she always keeps her cheery attitude, even after five years of battle. What he can't stand is her rambling and wild ideas. Who is this woman who dares think she has any say in battle? This is not her place. I cannot protect her out here. Not since the bonfire last night, she replies flatly. I need to speak to him, he urges, slapping a palm on the desk, now. Okay, what do you guys think? <clears throat> Who's the main character? Uh, Armander. Uh, what do you notice? It's written in present tense, right? So I gotta pay attention to that in case the author accidentally slips into past tense, which it can, can happen pretty easily if you're not skilled in writing present tense. Um, where is, where do you have a sense of location? You're gonna speak up really loud. Where does the story take place? Do you have enough clues? That's in the house. I thought something said war room. There's a war room. He's in he's in some sort of house. There's a desk. Stone There's a stone window. Bigger than that. Like geography. The Holly Festival is in full swing. So so those are some of the things that in these first pages when I'm looking at stories, when I'm looking at manuscripts that I want to pay attention to. Do I have a clear sense of who the main character is? Do I have a clear sense of place and setting and tone? Because I'm gonna to need to know that moving in so that if it's not clear until two or three pages down the way, I can find a detail and maybe pull it up to the front to help the reader get anchored where it's supposed to be. Um, part of it is really important. The Holly Festival's a full swing is really important to have on that first page because it's a story that was solicited for about dragons. So it could very easily have, this could very easily be in a fantasy setting, right? You don't know that for sure until, um, because all he's doing is he's at the desk, he's got a patch on his leg, he's smoking a hookah. But as soon as we hit the Holly Festival, I go, oh, this is, this is modern day. I know something about the Holly Festival. It's gonna be Indian culture. And right after that, the dragon wars are in a lull. So yes, this does have some sort of fantasy element, but it's gonna be tied to something familiar. That's important for me to help ground me and know the kind of story that the author is telling. It's not entirely fantasy, it's not entirely real world. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> and because I actually have the internet, I can actually bring up the dictionary. Yes. We'll, we'll come back. Okay, Armander rocks in the rusty desk chair, meditating to the squeak with each small movement. Um. <sighs> rusty it makes me think it's a metal desk chair, so I think the squeak is okay. Meditating to the squeak of, and I kind of want this to be of each small movement. Fingering the torn patch by his leg on his pant leg, maybe, because that's, it's a little bit more uh, specific. It also, because you can also read it if you're being really, really obsessive, which some readers are, that fingering the torn patch by his leg means it's not actually on his leg, that it's actually a patch on the desk next to him. Now, that might be something that is true. Is that true? It's on the chair. It's on the chair. So it's like a patch, like a military patch, maybe. No, there's, there's, 
there's a fabric on the chest. Okay. So I could make that more clear. So that might so that would be something where I wouldn't necessarily know that. I'm I'm guessing this is what's gonna make make it clear to me. And then when Ali looks at the edit and she's like, that's not what's happening at all. She knows that what she originally wrote isn't communicating her intention and she'll say, it's not his pant leg, it's not, it's none of this, it's, um, what it should say is fingering the torn patch by the leg of the chair. Is that more accurate? We're in the what? We're in the, in the fabric of the seat. In the fabric of the seat. Okay, fingering the torn patch of, uh, in, in the cushion? Yeah. Good. Did I spell that right? I didn't spell that right. How do you spell? Hey, thank you. Awesome. See, that's why I have the dictionary and spell check. Okay, so again, that's the kind of thing where I, I'm making my best guess as to what the author intends, and, I was, and I'm wrong. And, that's, and so that would be a conversation that we'd have. So fingering the torn patch in the cushion, he eyes the scorch marks along rooftops. And because here's something that, I don't know, is rooftops one word or two? One word, hooray. Uh, beyond the stone framed window, I'm hyphenating that because it's, they're both modifying window. Fingering the torn patch in the cushion, he eyes the scorch marks along rooftops beyond the stone framed window. And I might put, I'm gonna put the in there just to help a little bit with Clarity. He eyes the scorch marks along the rooftops beyond the stone framed window. I'm going to kind of keep an eye on that though because that might be an author style voice kind of issue uh, where the author may not rely as heavily on putting articles in as, as I might do. And so that would be something where if Ali then says, uh, I don't need it, I don't want it, it's ruining the rhythm or the poetry of that line that I want, of the scorch marks along rooftops. We could take it out. Um, first rule of editing is do no harm. I don't want to introduce an error. I don't want to make it worse. Um, I don't want to in have problems that the author needs to fix. But often, it could also be a missing word. So I'm going to leave it in because I'm the boss this time. Uh, drawing on his hookah, he manages a small grin as another splash of color hits the wall. So this is interesting because. As far as I know, he's sitting in the chair and he's looking out the window. So I'm thinking, which wall? Which wall is he looking at? Is it the outside wall? Is it the inside wall? As another splash of color hits the wall. Oh man, what do I do with that? Maybe I do this and, and cleverly avoid the issue of where the splash of color is happening because what it, what it, what's important is that he sees it. He sees the color. And it's probably more important that he sees it than the fact that it's hitting the wall. Purple, his favorite. Uh, today the Holly Festival is in full, squeak, full swing. And now I'm looking at this going, I wonder if Holly Festival is capitalized. Because sometimes they are. And so I would come here to Google and I would look up if Google is going to work. It's not. We'll pretend that I did. I would look up Holly Festival. I would do a little bit of research on that to make sure it's Holly with L-I and not two L's or that that, that is actually spelled correctly, that um, it's a real thing. Um, a little bit about the culture or anything to help anchor me in that. Today the Holly Festival is in full swing and the Dragon Wars are in a lull. Now I'm interested. What's about the dragon wars? That's pretty cool. Armander recalls the previous night as the dragons of the keep lit the bonfire to start the festival. And I'm going to look up bonfire just in case. Sweet. One word. Very good. Um, Armander recalls the previous night as the dragons of the keep lit the bonfire to start the festival. I release my fear of the monsters. I forgive my foes as is tradition. I forgive you for leaving me. Sita. Because this, this is internal thought, so it's appropriate to have it be italicized, but I'm going to treat it a little bit like dialogue. So I'm going to actually indent that and make it so its own paragraph rather than running it into the description of and the place of where he's at and the color. Because he's, he's thinking it as if he's talking to somebody. I release my fear of the monsters. I forgive my foes as is tradition. I forgive you for leaving me. I think that's really strong because it, the first two sentences 
have a feel of ritual to them, like that's what you say during the festival. And then I love this, I forgive you for leaving me, Sita. Here we have conflict, right? Second paragraph, we, we've got a problem, there's something that happened with Sita, and it requires forgiveness. That's also really intriguing and really important to have on your first page. If, I have only, if I'm only gonna read a first page of a manuscript, I wanna be able to at least identify some conflict. This is a very subtle and um, elegant way of introducing that. And I don't mind that I don't know who Sita is at this point, because I suspect, I trust that the story will tell me. Genevieve, uh, Genevieve rushes through the doorway, sending the curtains billowing. And you know, you know it, I'm gonna look up doorway just in case. One of these days, it's gonna be a different, it's gonna be two words. Uh, Genevieve rushes through the doorway, sending the curtains billowing. Her fiery curls bounce about, creating that halo of wildness and goddess. Um, that's really interesting. I don't know exactly what the author means about a halo of wildness and goddess, but I like the imagery of it. The fact that goddess is capitalized makes me assume, I assume that it's gonna be some kind of the, the religion that's gonna be um, in this world. But I'm wondering about that, and I'm wondering if it's, if it's better to say a, creating a halo of wildness and goddess. That is really specific, that there's only one halo that is possible, that it combines those things. And I'm not sure that that's true. So changing that to A opens it up to be a little bit more general. That other people might have that same halo or that she might have a different kind of halo some other day with her hair. I have the plans, she grins. Uh, I'm pointing this out because I appreciate that this is punctuated correctly. <laughs> that she grins is, her, is the sentence all by itself. Um, often. I'll see, I'll see things like this, where it's, I have the plans, comma, she laughs. But the action, she laughs, is separate from the actual dialogue. And so this way, I have the plans, is separate, is a separate action and a separate thing from she grins. If it's something where she, where it's an exclamation mark, but she said it, yeah, if you wanted to do this. Uh, that, that, that goes small, right? Yep. It's not cap. Yep. Okay. So if, if rather, if you wanted the dialogue tag after it, uh -huh. then it's lowercase. But if you're okay. following it with an action, it's Thank capitalized. You. Yes? Thoughts on the word echo? He grinned up above, she's grinning down here. If it's an intentional, that seems okay. Do the question. Um, oh, he manages a small grin. And then down here, I have the plan, she grins. Um, I, it didn't bother me. They felt like they were far enough away um, that, there, and that there was sort of enough action between that the, the repetition doesn't bother me. If it was right directly after each other, I'd probably change one of the two. Um, but that's a good catch. That's one of the things that kind of repetition to, to watch for. Yeah? Um, okay, so let's say that we didn't want to have an exclamation point there. Uh-huh. And it was an actual comma. Yep. Can you still do the lowercase, she grins, or as like she said, the dialogue you, do, you would do a dialogue tag like this. She okay. said, grinning. She grins. And the other thing I don't mind about this is because it's present tense, um, already I can start to tell that some of the sentences are going to be a little choppy. They're going to be a little fragmenty. Um, we already have that purple, his favorite. I mean, those kinds of things. So I don't mind that she grins, it's really short, and so I think that's fine. The freckles on her round face fold into the lines. Into the lines of what? Yeah, of what? Um, fold into, in, well, we already, so we already have grins, so we don't want that. Her freckles fold into the lines on her round face. Is that, did I hear somebody say that? Yeah. I like that. That's a good edit. You're now a beta reader. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go. Gold star. So here's an example where, and, and it actually also um, helps because it's moving the subject and the verb closer together, that her freckles fold instead of the freckles on her round face fold, and so keeping the subject and verb together creates a more dynamic and active kind of sentence. The freckles fold into the lines on her round face. I can picture that much easier than the other way around. Even though we, 
we pretty much only changed one word and just moved the other ones over. It's a, it's a stronger image, it's a stronger sentence. Uh, Armander enjoys the charm of her enchanting ivory skin. His own dark brown skin was loathed in his home. He finds the deep tea tint hard of his crosshatch skin to be admirably unique in spite of the old racist ideas of his Indian brothers. So I'm going to look up crosshatched because my instinct is to hyphenate it. It's not, but let's see. As a verb, it's a single word. As a noun, it's hyphenated. I want it as an adjective. Why is it not as an adjective? It's right there. Put in the ED. Am I just missing it? Can you see yeah. it on the screen? Scroll down right there. An example. Fields were cross-hatched by plowed paths. No, that's a verb. Well, thanks, Miriam Webster, for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, her question is about starting dialogue, and you can start in the middle of a paragraph like this. So, as long as, so is this the, the I have plans, or you're wondering why I didn't start a new paragraph there? Because it's all, that whole paragraph is about Genevieve and setting the stage, and that's all happening at the same time. So, um, if we had, if we'd had a lot of description about Genevieve, if we'd had like two or three more sentences, and then she said, I have the plans, I might start a new paragraph with her dialogue to help break it up. But because we only have two sentences, it's short enough and it keeps the pacing nice and, nice and tight. Um, it creates that sense that she's just rushing right in, she's just saying the thing, and it's all happening right at the same time. It would be incorrect to start a new campaign? Um, it, wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily, no, it wouldn't be incorrect. You could very easily do this. But uh, one of the dangers of too many short paragraphs is then that your story gets really choppy. And so, again, it's, it's a question of balancing pacing and style. Another editor might put a, a paragraph return there, but I'm, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so, okay. Um, Armander enjoys the charm of her enchanting ivory skin. How, do we know, how, we don't know how old Gen Genevieve is. I assume that she's young because she's pretty exuberant and she's got freckles, which for some reason makes me think she's young. I don't know for sure. So I'm a little, I'm keeping an eye on the, the charm of her enchanting ivory skin. Because if she's his daughter or if she's little, I don't know, that might seem, that might seem creepy. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait and see until I know a little bit more about Genevieve. And, and so I might come back and change that. That's the other thing about editing is I will often go back and read things two or three times when I know more of the story. So I know what kind of details to put in there. So his own dark brown skin was loathed in his home. There's something about that that just, it just feels clunky. Um, and I kind of wanted to do this. The, I think it's because this, everything else is present tense and I'm, I'm kind of getting in that mindset and so was loathed is past tense. Even though it's true, it, it was, it had had, it was something that had happened in his past. Um, it, it, the, the change in the tense is tripping me up. So I kind of want to do this. I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to put it up there for now. So Armander enjoys the charm of her enchanting ivory skin, so different from his own. He finds the deep tea tint of his cross-hatched skin to be admirably unique in spite of the old racist idea of his Indian brothers and even his own family. To me, for, so for me, that brings up the fact that his dark brown skin was loathed at home, that that was something that he was ashamed of or something that was a, a date of something that was not good. And I tacked it onto this idea of the racist ideas of his Indian brothers. So clearly he's, exper he's, he's a character who has experienced some prejudice not only from people close to him, but from people in his own culture. Yes? When you're making these changes, it's just helpful sense of adding the idea of it somewhere else in your own words. How much of that thought process do you tell the author so they know 
know why, why I did it. <laughs> um, I, stuff like this, I probably wouldn't leave a note. If I'm rewriting, if I'm moving something entirely or if I'm gonna cut like more than one paragraph right out, um, I will often leave a note. Like for example, one thing I might do here is I'll leave a comment and say, um, uh, did I capture your intention correctly with this edit? And then when it gets back to Allie, she'll not only see that I made this change, but that she'll get a note for me and, if, and, and she'll know that I'm, I want her opinion. If I didn't get it right, uh, well, let's talk about it. Um, but usually, if, if it's just within a, you know, if it's just a couple sentences, I just do it and move on. Um, any more than that, I'll try to say, hey, I changed a bunch. Are you okay with how this turned out? Or if I really don't understand it and I can't figure it out and I just don't even know what's going on, I'll just highlight it and say, I, you got to help me here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand where these people are. Okay. Any, any questions? Other, other questions so far? You guys are like the best at this because other times I've done this, we get like through two paragraphs. We're cruising. There was a hand over here. I just feel like I need her name again. You need her. You need Genevieve's name. I don't. I don't mind it because um, we've got it here. We get. We talk about her fiery curls. She's grinning. We talk about her freckles, her skin, um, and. Because we're from Armander's POV, it's also a question of how often would he think about her proper name. Um, in fiction, characters call each other by proper names all the time. That doesn't happen in real life. How many times do you have a conversation with your family or your best friend where you're constantly saying, well, Allie, as you know, I'd love to have lunch with you this afternoon. And she says, Lisa, that would be great. I would love to have lunch with you. you we don't talk like that. And so. You, you also have to remember from his point of view, he might still just be thinking of her as her and she. And she's the only her in the room. So I don't need to differentiate, there's just the two of them. Now if we're going to get a lot more people or if I'm going to go three, four, five more paragraphs or pages without dropping her name in again, then I'd, I'd find a place to put it in. Okay. Tossing her rolled parchments along the dining table that doubled as desk in this dim war room. Here's a, see, here's another example of not having an article in front of a noun. So now I'm starting to think maybe this is a style thing, maybe this is an author thing. I'm still going to put it in because I think it reads better. Tossing her rolled parchments along the dining table that doubled as a desk in this dim war room. Guess what I'm going to look up? War room. That totally is not going to be one word. <laughs> Sweet. She bubbles on. Yeah, tense shift in that first line. Double, double should be uh, present. That doubles? Mm -hmm. This is why I, as you can notice, I keep rereading the sentence over and over to, even after I've made an edit, to make sure it's still working. Or I'll find something else. So tossing her rolled parchments along the dining table that doubles as a desk in this dim war room, she bubbles on. I remembered in the dreams last night, bless ye Bridget, putting a comma there to separate a noun of direct address. I'm also curious about Bridget, but it feels like a prayer. Um, that interjection sort of feels like a prayer. The paintings I made as a child. Um, the, now my mother would yell at me to quit messing about with my hands, waving the air and all, and my dad would have believed that I was really painting with. I'm, I really don't understand what she's trying to say here. So here's an example of, I would do this. Um, it'd be like, uh, I'm not sure what she is trying to say here is Bridget, her mom by chance, um, is, uh, is her mom Zeta, by chance. Um, so I'm going to need, I, I feel like I need a little bit more. I'm getting dropped into this conversation right off the bat. She rushes in, she says, I have a plan. She puts them on the table and then she does this thing about the dreams and she drops this other thing and the paintings and the mom and I'm 
feeling kind of lost, but I, I understand this idea that mom would yell at me to quit messing about with my hands, waving in the air and all, and my da there would have believed that I was really painting with. And so clearly she's got some dialect going on with my non there, my da there woulda. So that helps me understand that. It also makes me think Genevieve is younger. Um, that is starting to confirm my suspicion that she's um, not an adult. I could still be wrong about that, but that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm believing. That I was really painting with. Here's an example of ellipses. That should be an M dash. So usually ellipses indicate trailing thoughts, trailing dialogue, and an M dash is a hard interruption, is a hard cut. So she's, my daughter would believe that I was really painting with, and because we know here, Armander interrupts, I'm going to change those ellipses to an M dash. After the M dash, do you need a period to complete that thought? No, no, you do not have a period after the M dash, because it's a hard interruption. You're just like, wham, in there. What about a space after, between the M dash and the M A space between the M dash and the just quotation mark. Right just one right after the other. The woulda, is that correct? It's, it's correct for the character. Yeah, so it's obviously not a real word uh, in English, but because it's the my da ne'er woulda, that all is going to be character voice. I'm leaving it in. Have you seen Aziz? Armander interrupts. I don't know who Aziz is, but I'm curious. Especially because here, her smile transforms into a scowl. Now why... We don't need a comma here. Now why don't you ever listen to me, you big lout? We do need a comma here. And I, I am not a fan of um, the interrobang or <laughs> double, double up punctuation. You pick one or the other. And because it's a question, it, it gets the question mark. So I come in here with, and again, we're going to interrupt. So I'm putting an M dash in there. Focus Genevieve, comma, in front of a noun of direct address. Aziz, have you seen him? Armitter admires the way she always keeps her cheery attitude, even after five years of battle. That's interesting. It tells me something about Genevieve. Um, now I think she's not that young if she's been in battle. I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt. No, I you're just, fine. Um, I'm just curious. At what point in like a manship like this would you be like, oh, I think I'm going to tap out? Like with your grammar and with the things that you're checking. Um, so far, nothing has, has really raised a, a, flag, a large enough flag for me to say, I'm out. Um, because everything that I've changed so far has been pretty minor. It's been a couple, a couple wordy things, some punctuation kinds of things. Um, I'm still intrigued enough by the character and the setting. And I, I don't feel like I've really gotten to know like what the problem is going to be. Um, that I still keep reading. Yeah. Um, farther up, when she said that she had the dream she had of as a child. See the oh yes. I made as a child. Therefore, she has to be older than that. She's got to be older than that. So, yes, good point. So, again, one of the things that I might ask the author is, is there a way to anchor Genevieve's age earlier? Maybe it's just me reading too fast and I missed it and that's going to be okay. It does happen that there was actually, I read a whole story and <laughs> I was first person and I, I wrote back to the author and I said, I'm really sorry. Um, I didn't choose it for the anthology. I thought your main character was, and referred to the main character as a man. And the author wrote back and said, actually, um, it was a woman. And I, re and I went back and like the second sentence clarified that, and I had just missed it entirely. So I read the whole story thinking it was a guy. It happens. It's not why I turned it down, but that happens. Okay. Um, Armander admires the way she always keeps her cheery attitude even after five years of battle. What he can't stand is her rambling and wild ideas. Who is this woman who dares think she has any say in battle? This is not her place. I cannot protect her out there. Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the di I'm gonna put treat this as dialogue, um, even though it's interior thought. Um, there's something that it's I want I want Armander to be more frustrated right here because he's already he's interrupted her twice, and she's been really like excited, she's got these plans, it's gonna be really like, she's, she's on a mission. And admires and cheery are both really positive, comfortable, kind of, kind of relaxing words. And, and I kind of want him this, what he can't stand is her rambling and wild ideas. So we, I'm not sure that I actually have time to, because I got the five minute warning and we're almost, we're almost out of time. 
So, um, I would, uh, I almost kind of want to do this and move it so, uh, well, let's see, under, I'm, I might, I might want to do something where, uh, this is going to be dumb, but something, some, some visual cue that, of his unhappiness. And because then we can go right into this, who is this woman who dares think she has any say in battle? This is not her place. I cannot protect her out there. That gets me to his frustration and gets me to his, his unhappiness way faster than admiring her cheery attitude. And so maybe we can do something like this. Myers, though Armander admires her cheery attitude even after five years of battle, uh, he, he can't stand her rambling and wild ideas. So that again, so now we've, we've focused on him being unhappy and, and frustrated, and, but then we can kind of, he can still sort of pull back and say, yeah, but okay, she still, I acknowledge that she's still kind of going to be okay, but we got to move it along. I think that's very telling too. There may be some showing ways you can do that. There might be show, some showing ways. Um, I, because this was a short story, there was a hard word limit, hard word count, so that, and in short stories, there's sometimes it's okay to do a little telling. Right. But yes, that would be another place you could look and say, maybe the way to fix this is to show. Way in the back and then right up here. Is that a good idea to have two kinds of internal dialogue, one right after the other? Yeah. Yeah, and that and that's kind of what we were talking about before. The one, the who is this woman? We're we're deep in his POV, and the other one is not. And so that might be another. This might be another case where I'll leave a note saying, "This is what I'm trying to accomplish." Maybe is there a way that it can all be internal thought, um, so that he can think, "I cannot protect her out there." You know, I. I'm glad she's so happy that she's going to get herself killed. That could be tacked on into the um, italicized thought as well. So the amount of editing you're doing here, is this pretty standard? Is this a bit more, a bit less, just as an author, how much red should we expect in that? Um, this is pretty standard um, kind of thing. If you want, do I have, uh, I'm going to, I'll show you one. Let's see if I can show you one that I actually did a lot of editing on. Edited. Let's see. Here's, here's just one that ended up in the book. And I think I still have all markup. Yeah, so here's, here's an example of, this was one of the stories that got in the, there, so I'm gonna just kind of scroll through this kind of quickly and you can kind of see all the red stuff Stuff that I changed. I always put dingbat in as a sign for scenery. Sometimes my authors think I'm calling them dingbat and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's technically what it's called. The little graphic element of the scene break is called a dingbat. You'll notice nice, here. Nice to know. Yeah. You'll notice here, Jonathan originally was spelled with an O and I, it's been corrected to an A. That's because halfway through the, the story, it it switched, so I asked the author, which way are you spelling his name? And he said, oh, it's Jonathan with an A, so search and replace, fix it. So, so I mean, that, I mean that's, this, is, this is pretty standard in terms of how much editing I do at the end of the day. Um, so anyway, I hope this was helpful. I know we, we maybe have time for one more question. Uh, yes? I was just wondering on the other that you've been working on. Yeah. Um, it seemed like there was the internal dialogue was quite a break between his question and her response. Oh, here the. You know, he says, "Hey, come on, focus." Have you seen him? And it was oh. all of his thoughts before she says. Before she says last night. Yeah, and so that would be another thing that I'd look at to make sure the pacing is that the the conversation is happening fast enough, and we don't lose that with too much internal dialogue. Okay, I I think we're all done. Thanks. <laughs>